Good evening, everybody. I'm very pleased uh, to learn that though the weather is rather nice, some of you at least found the way to the Kett Hamburger Kolleg, Lois Kalscher, in order to share with us new insights about a rather interesting, not as uh, easily conceivable relationship between art and law and the law that will be discussed in the evening the, during this evening with two experts and how much expertise will be in this uh, house uh, tonight must uh, in the beginning be announced in only a few words and I have to start with uh, Mani Singh, who will present a lecture about law and painterly tales of violence and justice in times of globalization. This title is so precise that there is uh, nearly no need to explain anything anymore and we just could meditate about the title and perhaps it would be and see the pictures and would certainly have a lot of uh, impressions by that. But in order to make it uh, understandable and um, to make it uh, to, uh, to to get an, a rational access uh, to to those problems, uh, it seemed to be necessary for uh, Mani Sheka Singh uh, to study sociology some years ago at uh, the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi, as I said. Uh, obtaining his doctorate uh, by the way with a thesis entitled Folk Art Identity and Performance a Sociological Study. So he remained a little bit in uh, his topic and then uh, next to teaching obligations uh, at the University of Delhi he taught at the New School for Social Research in New York. He has received numerous scholarships and awards for his work in the fields and that's uh, in the field, a special field, a field of visual culture. So if we talk about visual, uh, if we talk about the turns in cultural studies, uh, the story turn, the narrative turn, the uh, pictorial turn, a lot of turns, the cultural turn in uh, cultural studies, the visual turn is an important one, I think, and we, you will explain to us what it means for your specific topic. Just in order to continue uh, this impressive career, uh, you should uh, know that uh, uh, Mani also came to Europe in order to uh, study and to make his research at the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme in uh, Paris, where he was direct, uh, director d'études associé uh, à la Maison des Sciences de l'Homme uh, in 2010. And uh, uh, aside or besides um, stipends from the India, New India Foundation, the Rockefeller stipend at Johns, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, Indian Foundation for the Arts stipend, he also received a stipend from the Volkswagen Foundation at the University of Heidelberg. But even more important for us, of course, is, is that he shared with us for a longer while now uh, our uh, common task to bring uh, law and culture closer together here at uh, the Center uh, for Advanced Study Law as Culture. Um, I thank you very much for having prepared uh, a specific topic, uh, a specific lecture for, for this evening and um, uh, without being too long, very, very shortly only. I think we should remember how fundamental those questions can be if we relate uh, law to art. We have, most of you know, a strong movement of bringing uh, law and literature together. So this is a strand in the American uh, uh, research field, a very strong one. We talk much less about the relationship of uh, law and music, for example. Why that? 
and we, we think to make such an event next year. We want to do something new. I think that this can be a new topic if it is not just an invention. I think we have good arguments to do that. But the relationship of law and opera, uh, law and uh, other visual arts has to be studied very precisely. And there we have, uh, we fall into a, a very difficult field of research, that is how to do sociology, anthropology of picturing, of pictures. A lot of very heavy and severe methodological problems that are behind. Going back to old and former ideas of how pictures would mirror society. So the mirror approach is one. The representational approach is another one, including the question whether things as abstract as law could be represented at all. Violence seems to be much more concrete. In, in, injustice also, but justice, how to represent. And the way to represent can be by way of metaphors, by more concrete images, as uh, Jose Garcia has done it for a while uh, at our center uh, with regard to the blindfoldedness foldedness of justice. And that is why he will be the second speaker today. But to bring Poe ethics to, so to say, poetry and aesthetics to uh, the side of ethics and the law and to see what the relationship can be beyond just giving an image or uh, just mirroring whatever it may be, perhaps also to be a critique of real life circumstances and uh, uh, perhaps also in a, in, in a way and in a direction to symbolically enforce the force of law, all this is possible as well. So we have a complicated relationship, but we have a special case. A special case in a specific cultural and uh, civilizational context where we would like to know whether the legal cultural uh, environment, the perspective of the events that are elucidated by way of those pictures, have an impact also on the general question how to conceive this complicated, visibly con complicated relationship of law and the art. So I think we have a lot to learn uh, from, from your uh, lecture and I'm uh, very curious to know and to also to see the pictures. Did you receive this, uh, this wonderful invitation card? And uh, I can, I'm allowed to say it this time because it is not my proper pictures, it is just uh, pictures from your art and our artist, our designer in residence he has done, I think, a, a wonderful uh, invitation card for that. And I, I, I would like to, give, to, 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 to make a little bit of applause for I mean, He's not present, but there will be people to tell him that we liked it. Uh, if you don't like it, you can refuse, of course. But I think uh, it uh, m might also be a nice um, idea to remember uh, this evening. Because I have to say it from the beginning on uh, that this will be the last uh, lecture Mani can give during his current fellowship and of course we hope to see him again on other occasions because you're uh, so much linked to uh, our concerns and uh, it would be wonderful also to continue the, uh, the, the, the interchange because the interchange and this uh, I was leaving aside 
is now going to your next place and your next professional appointment at Jindal Global Law School and, and India and this is a very specific place. You have to go to the internet, you have to make your p uh, first impressions and we are very, very much, uh, we, we intend very much to uh, continue the interchange and uh, to make common projects for the future. But that's another story. So we go now to storytelling by way of pictures about horrible events you have to tell us about. But in the uh, tension that we know also from, from other traditions, to see the beauty and the horror, the horror in the same time. And you will explain what this kind of tension might emotionally mean for those who look at those pictures, who made the pictures, and what they perhaps also in intended to present and to represent. So thank you very much for coming, and the floor is yours. begin with, I must apologize for a couple of things. Uh, this paper which I am going to present uh, might be long, slightly long, because I want to linger with some of the images which I intend to show. And there are a number of images. I tried to reduce it, but uh, this is the best I could do. There were many more. <coughs> So three hours or four hours? Just no, uh, <laughs> one hour or so. Okay, yeah. And I must also apologize uh, that I am not very good at, you know, just speaking without looking at uh, the pages, the written stuff, because I have this propensity of meandering into whole lot of insignificant things and in then it will become four hours or I don't know how many hours so I will uh, try to you know uh, stick to my stuff and uh, for most part I'll read out things and please don't hesitate uh, if you have any things which you can't understand because I've tried to reduce some of the words from, let's say, Hindi, Sanskrit, and other Indian languages. Um, but if you have any problem, please stop me. I'll try to best of my ability to, you know, explain then and there. Or else we can return back to the thing. Uh, Professor Gephardt has um, put on table too many questions. Uh, some of them are extremely difficult and I'm not competent to, you know, even vaguely answer those things. Uh, law and images and law and art relationship, how does one talk about abstract uh, concepts? Uh, that has always bothered me. Uh, um, why um, only through art? I mean, when you write, I mean, some abstraction, how do you begin to even conceptualize abstract concepts while writing? And uh, with art, it becomes doubly difficult because we are dealing with images. And I already, I tried reducing some of the abstractness. I tried draining out, let's put it that way. That's why I put this painterly tales. Or if I just had law, art, justice, and globalization, I was done. I mean, there were too many <laughs> complicated stuff there. Uh, law, I have no idea about because I am not trained in that discipline. Globalization, I know very little about except <laughs> Except that we live in a global age, and <laughs> uh, and justice. All of us crib about justice, but if you stop anyone and ask that, what do you mean by justice? I think very few people will be able to tell you. I mean, it's again a very, it's that complicated. But anyway, 
Having said that, what I'll try and do uh, is uh, just concentrate on two sets of images. And these images uh, are done by relatively young artists. When I say relatively uh, young, uh, that means they are in their early 20s, mostly by women. Uh, and uh, they belong to the so-called folk art tradition. Now, I don't like using this term folk art because of the global inflows or image flows, etc. I mean, no one is folk anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll keep using it uh, uh, at times. So let me begin. Then the increase attention to the visual and architectural depiction of justice spurred by the recent literature, in particular Resnick and Curtis's majestic book, Representing Justice, invites us to take seriously questions regarding figuration, space, visibility, and the profound resilience connection of these qualities through the deployment and exclusion of, execution of justice. Alison Tate foregrounds the discussion on the topic into two broad ways of perceiving justice. While the first deals with notion of seeing justice, the second elicits debate around sitting justice. The scholarship around seeing justice has basically focused on visual representations of the allegorical female figure of justice. That is the personification of justice as a historical and political virtue. Similarly, the writings on themes of sitting justice charts out the relationship between court architecture and adjudicatory democracy. Although the growing literature on the changing iconography of justice is insightful, it has more or less overlooked the ways in which the image of justice inhabits or has been made to inhabit post-colonial context. Nor has this literature sufficiently scrutinized those visual depictions of justice that belong to the so of what one might call the folk or the vernacular cultural expressions. My presentation this evening is more exploratory than exhaustive in nature. Therefore, I will not aim to traverse the entire gamut of visual fields that I have just indicated above. Although mapping their transformative journey remains part of my larger project, rather I'll make available some of the ways in which justice is visualized or finds its voice, as it were, in the pictorial language of methyl art, a folk painterly tradition practiced primarily by women in Mithila region of eastern part of India. So, uh, this is basically the Mithla would be, it will also consist part of present in Nepal and, and, and basically m mostly northern part of Bihar, Indian state of Bihar. Taking examples from the artwork of young painters, mostly women in the early 20s, I'll explore how violence and the possibility or impossibility of justice is pictured. Such picturization seldom derive the inspiration from the imagery enunciated by the state law in India. Even when the artists do tangentially allude to some of what some have called law's art, their creative ways of evoking justice inhabit legally plural worlds, sometimes implying a renunciation of state law. But before I delve into methyl art take on law, let me very briefly sketch the historical background of metal painting tradition. And as a woman's domestic ritual art of making sacred diagrams on ceremonial occasions, especially during the life course rituals like the wedding ceremony, so this is the painting, so during wedding ceremony on one of the walls inside the bridal chamber, the eastern wall, but this is the painting which is done. And this diagram is basically a diagram of a lotus, lotus plant. 
Metal painting has existed for centuries in Mithila region. However, it came to the notice of the outside world due to unfortunate quirk of nature. In the winter of 1934, a massive earthquake wrecked most villages of Mithila, especially the present-day Madhubani district. While organizing the relief work, William Archer, a colonial officer, chanced upon a brilliantly colored mural adorning the inner chamber of an upper caste Brahmin home. The visual impact of the painted figures emerging from the shattered wall was such that it simply left him spellbound. Years later in his memoir, Archer wrote about that encounter in the following words. I had seen nothing which so instinctively took for granted the assumptions of modern European art. In its dreamlike vacuousness, the painting reminded him of Klee, Miro, and Picasso. But despite Archer's, I, I must just very briefly tell you something that Archer uh, also was able to relate to this painting was uh, that he studied in Cambridge in 20s and that was the phase when post-impressionist movement was at speak and two exhibitions were mounted in London. Uh, and uh, so instantly like he could relate to this art uh, uh, but the irony was that he saw it not as an Indian art form but from a modernist perspective as a modern art form. But despite Archer's excitement and his scholarly article in Mark's journal, metal painting remained confined to its local setting. Ironically, it was only as a result of another natural calamity, the Bihar famine of 1966-67, that this art was propelled onto global stage. A severe drought in 1966-67 resulted in the worst famine in living history. Once again, the villages in Mithila region were pushed on the brink of starvation. Pupul Jaikar, who was then heading the All India Handicraft Board, recalled Archer's writings. A plan was put in place. The Handicraft Board dispatched Bhaskar Kulkarni, a young artist, with paper and paint to Madhubani in Mithila. His brief was to motivate the women to transfer their ritual wall art onto paper, collect the finished paintings and deliver them to Delhi Office of Handicraft Board. The Handicraft Board along with other government agencies would then market these paintings in India and abroad. In the winter of 1967, the first large scale exhibition of metal art was organized in Delhi. The overwhelming response motivated uh, the Indian government to send some of the exhibits for display at the Montreal World's Fair of 1967. This was followed by a series of exhibitions in different metropolitan centers, both within and outside India, showcasing the enchanting artwork of metal women painters. I'd just like to show you three paintings, and it will give you some sense of what that initial phase and the sort. So this is uh, the painting of, uh, of uh, basically challenges the duality of man and woman. So here is Lord Shiva who is also a half woman. Uh, this is again because of the slide we can't uh, actually focus. Um, on this painting again is uh, Krishna and Radha and this is like uh, performing uh, this uh, Ras Leela and this is uh, a serpent maiden this is another painting so th th this is the initial part in the early 60s this is the sort of work which was being produced the most iconic of these exhibition was organized in Paris in 1975 the catalog was prepared by Meget, one of the leading galleries of France. And with the opening, this was the cover used for that, that exhibition in Paris in 75. And with the opening of Mithila Museum in Tokamashi Nigata Prefecture in Japan in 1982, one could safely say that Mithila painting had arrived on the global stage. Although traditionally a wall art, form primarily depicting ritual motives, 
Since its invention on paper in the late 1960s for a wider circulation and commercial exchange, methyl artists have also explored the arts potential in narrating non-ritual themes related to war on terror, communal and gender violence, murder, corruption, dowry death, and so on. The wide array of such painterly tales undoubtedly demonstrates the metal artist's sustained engagement with issues of law, violence, and justice. This is, now I shift to, uh, this is the first set of paintings I, I want to concentrate on. I begin with a series of paintings depicting, uh, uh, depicting the 2002 violence and its aftermath in the Indian state of Gujarat. On the morning of 27th February 2002 at Godra railway station, a carriage of Ahmada bound Sabarmati Express was set ablaze, charring to death 59 helpless passengers. Majority of them were voluntary workers returning home from the North Indian pilgrim town of Ayodhya, said to be the birthplace of Ram. They had gone there to participate in a political ceremony aimed at forcibly constructing a temple devoted to Ram at the very site where Babri Masjid, a 16th century mosque, once stood. The Godra incident triggered a statewide violence in which several hundred Muslim families lost their lives and property. The spread of violence um, and the Gujarat government's complicity left many Indians like Santosh Kumar Das, a young methyl artist living in Ranti village in Bihar, deeply shocked. Uh, and I remember later when I was talking to him during one of my interviews, uh, this is what he had to say. Uh, I am not a, po a political person, he told me during one of my interviews. I don't watch television news regularly. When this, that is Gujarat violence, happened, I was deeply shocked and pained. I thought to myself, how could anyone do such a thing in the name of religion? Santosh Das spent next several months on composing his series of 23 paintings on Gujarat violence of 2002. Uh, I will obviously not show you the, all the 23 paintings, but I have chosen uh, some, some from that series. Painted in an infill uh, style, or which is also called Kachini technique in Mithla, uh, which he had inherited from his mother, the Gujarat series is primarily based on stories and visuals that appeared in the print and electronic media during and after the violence. But even though the media scape provides the scaffold on which the artist constitutes the series, the pictorial rendering of the violence is neither a copy of media images nor a replication of the reportage and the mag magazine articles. Compositionally, the Gujarat series can hardly be said to be based on the eyewitness principle, so valued in the genre of history painting. Nor do the paintings work as traces of what Rola Bath famously described in the context of photographs as this has been. Rather, as I would like to propose, the painting constituting the Gujarat series operates between two worldviews, between myth and history. The images are intentionally led or framed with Hindu mythological icons and stories, especially from the Ramayana. Such a layering enables the artist to mobilize a powerful critique of the politics and violence unleashed by the Hindu fundamentalist ideologies from within the tradition of Hinduism. I must tell you one thing. Um, it might not be that important. Initially, I had thought I will uh, I'll do something along those lines, but then again, it was going in too many directions. After the Gujarat uh, violence which happened um, in India, uh, you know, like, uh, the response was varied. So, uh, Santosh, this artist, uh, this was one sort of very unique response and that's why I have uh, concentrated on his work. There were other very well-known, established, modernist painters from India. Uh, who also painted after Gujarat. 
Now their strategy was quite different. Uh, what they were doing, um, they were in a sense like uh, trying to uh, counterpose this this sort of violence initiated by hardline Hindu uh, ideological institutions by counterposing it with some sort of secularism. So in, in their scheme of things, something had gone wrong with secularism and it had to be set right. So it was like uh, communal, communalism operating on one register, secularism on the other. So they were trying to counterbalance by, by in a sense, draining some of these images of their, their religious intonation and in a way then tr hoping that it will become a more sort of secular sort of representation which I think is a totally futile exercise because you are talking to someone who is not interested in your discourse rather someone like Santosh who critiques uh, these ideologies from within tradition and we will see how and I think that that criticism is more powerful than a sort of this secularist sort of you know uh, take on 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 some of some of the paintings and the images i wish i could have you know counterposed and done but then it would have just become simply too long i'll just concentrate on this and let's see where we get with this set of images the first painting in the series depicts a circular image circular image of mother earth flanked by durga and shiv the primordial hindu deities the theme can be traced to a foundational myth in devi mahatma devi mahatma is a text which narrates how uh, the goddess durga came into being According to the myth, the gods, after suffering a crushing defeat at the hands of demon, King Mahisa approached Vishnu and Shiva, the preserver and destroyer of Hindu trinity, for help. On hearing plight of the gods, uh, Vishnu and Shiva are enraged and out of this rage is formed the goddess Durga, who then goes on to vanquish uh, the demon. The myth ends with her consent to bring relief to those who will call upon her in future calamity. So the, that entire thing ends that ever in future you need my help, you have to just call me and I'll appear uh, and, and help you. And uh, by the way, um, uh, there are a couple of very interesting works. Uh, one, you must be um, familiar with uh, William Sachs his work and he's shown how the local sort of uh, politics and, and 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 various other things utilize this myth so it, it's a myth which has been uh, circulated even in in modern times and reused for various uh, purposes so uh, it is there uh, that santosh also plugs in this painting the earth mother weeps at the violence which has unfolded in Gujarat. Shiva is infuriated and once again he gives form to the goddess to defeat the demonic forces in Gujarat and establish moral order, dharma, and bring justice, nyay, to the affected people. The floating weapons around the goddess Durga connotes this process which is set in motion. So these are the floating the two paintings, um, con uh, the next two paintings which I want to take, I will not describe much, but they continue to build on this uh, Hindu mythological past. So, uh, in this, uh, this is the figure of Ram, he is being prayed by, you know, there are various uh, men, women, sages, they are all, all praying. And, and there is another one in which uh, both of them are, are, are praying in front of, uh, this is Shivling, uh, before uh, actually, uh, this, is a, this is a scene from the Ramayana. Uh, in, anyway, so I will just, just move forward, otherwise it will just get. 
why has no the thing which puzzled me when when i first uh, started looking at at the series is that a series on gujarat violence why has the artist the first three paintings are i mean initially have nothing to do with the gujarat violence as such why has the artist thought it appropriate to begin a series on 2002 gujarat violence in this manner and how are the viewing publics to comprehend these hindu icons and motives in the context of horrific violence carried out in its name the issues posed by the three paintings especially with regards to the critical intent begin to unravel the moment we consider them in relationship to other paintings in the series through these initial compositions which in a sense form a set within a set or series the artist makes available to the viewer a religious iconography one that provides the semiotic infrastructure to the later figures in the series to make the intensities felt for him uh, the violence for him the artist the, the violence can be meaningfully grasped in relationship to the past one that lies outside linear historical time now i quickly i want to shift to the next uh, section um, the godra in incident is subject matter of the fourth painting in the series so actually is the fourth painting in the series which uh, uh, depicts that that godra incident the artist evokes this much publicized scene by depicting the train engulfed by fire charging to death 59 passengers in the painting the engine of the ill fated sabarmati express faces the viewer thereby emphasizing its outward movement due to this compositional strategy the train does not recede into the distant horizon rather it moves as it were towards the viewer thereby looming large on his or her consciousness a constant reminder of the tragedy the following two composition depict bodies trapped in flames using what one might call a zoom in technique so the next the couple more paintings which then as it were as if you are moving in and is just the bodies entrapped in flame the unfolding of events as it was widely reported witnessed the emergence of new characters with political patronage indulging freely in death and destruction a number of paintings in the series address this turn of events for instance one composition we find a larger than life figure of a hindu rioter unabashedly indulging in act of violence he is extending one of his hands towards the group of terrified children while with the other hand he is guarding the weeping children he has assembled in the next composition we find that the rioter has acquired an iconic status his statue like figure with multiple outlines is placed against a whirl whirling pattern in the background the pattern visually connects the two composition in the series but these are some of the techniques which he keeps using i mean i since this paper is not about uh, technique per se so that's why i have chopped all those things but the various uh, experimentation also simultaneously he is doing in 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 the series uh, technically the multiple outlines produce what uh, rudolf anheim would call a stratoscopic effect thereby animating the body as a result of such a visual impact the figure appears to be brandishing his sword from one hand to the other multiple outlines can also be read as standing for plurality of people in this way a single image can be made to stand for a crowd something which people like uspensky and that entire russian school ha have uh, demonstrated in in context of uh, your icon icon painting um, christian icon painting of europe and rest of the field is filled with uh, tridents uh, the pictorial field of the next painting is divided into two horizontal sections 
the upper section houses a colossal figure of narendra modi the incumbent chief minister in profile with folded hand so the gujarat violence actually took place when uh, narendra modi was the chief minister he is still the chief minister right now uh, the burning background teeming with figures with daggers in their hand accent accentuates the image of modi the icon like modi is juxtaposed with the figure of mahatma gandhi the father of nation and apostle of non violence a forgotten man in his own land the mahatma is lying in his grave with he ram literally o ram inscribed on it these were the last word uttered by him after being shot by nathuram godse a hindu fanatic the inscription he ram is epigrammatic in the classical sense when read by the viewer the inscription gives voice to the event that resulted in gandhi's death and thereby it assists in anchoring the floating chain of signifiers within the image field the two sections housing modi and gandhi are joined by two rows of figures marching in unison from left to right of the field these figures which are flanked by structures of temple and a mosque represent a section of gujarati society desperately trying to make sense of the situation i find this painting really very interesting for that sense i mean it it can be you know you one can spend a lot of time trying to you know explain this thing uh is also this in a very interesting way uh, as we'll see that uh, this pictorial strategy of of using uh, two desperate sort of image or event side by side uh, to to explain something so here is gandhi uh, and 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 counterposing it with uh, with narendra modi who everyone knows that is was responsible for what happened but has not been proven so he is still roaming outside and the court case cases are still going on the growing resentment against modi and his government's involvement in the carnage of in innocent muslims during the riot form the subject matter of the next painting the demand for modi's remo removal as the chief minister of gujarat can be read on a banner displaying the slogan modi ko hatao literally remove modi in the lower section of the field the background of this painting is a repeat pattern made of raised fists again this fist fat, uh, pattern signifying widespread protest by the civil society the artist foregrounds a black figure in a dancing posture with a sword in hand person personifying kaliyug literally the black epoch the present den denigrate times the visual impact of this bl black dancing figure in the upper section of the composition is such that it submerges the protest of the civil society this composition therefore brings to our notice that even with growing protests the dance of death continues the next set of painting which i want to take up uh, form actually are these uh, one could uh, club it under i have i've tried to organize it under this heading um, basically dwell on the micro theme of safe shelters and relief camps during the time of violence and thereafter in one of these paintings for instance three muslim men are shown rushing towards a safe hideout to escape the mob fury they are without limbs the imagery creates a visual tension which is further accentuated by the hand gesture a gesture typically signaling helplessness despite the figures begging for safety the shelter turns hostile this is connoted by the artist in the form of a large opening with a sharp teeth like inner lining we often come across such imageries in mythic tales in which demons are shown tricking the gods and humans through transfiguration the cave as a shelter transforming into a demon's mouth excuse me 
we don't have the picture. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is the picture. Uh, this is the inner lining of the mouth. Actually, th this imagery one comes across very frequently in some of uh, these uh, these texts, the folk tales, where uh, uh, the demons trick the gods. Uh, they take a form of, let's say, a cave or something, and the moment they enter, they, then they, are, you know, they gobble them up, literally. The uh, the Shah Alam camp. Uh, so uh, the next painting I want to shift to. Yeah, this would be the, the Shah Kal uh, Alam camp in Ahmedabad, uh, which was one of the largest community shelter for Muslim families during and after the riots, constitute the subject matter of two paintings in the series. In the first rendition of this theme, the upper section of the pictorial field is filled with two rows of faces uh, looking in opposite direction. The lower section is occupied by figures of two women in sitting posture, each cuddling a child. A leafy plant emerging from the base proliferates to cover the background. In this composition, the artist has used the images of the plant and the child as motif representing hope and regeneration amidst the dark despair of genocidal violence. But as we shift to the next rendition of the Shah Alam uh, Cat theme, we have presented a much gloomier picture of the prevailing situation. In the upper section, the burst-like figures are confined within a small black square, uh, pulsating with anxiety and fear. In the lower section, the figures of seated women of the preceding composition give way to women with visibly worried looks. And although the leafy pattern has matured into, into a blossoming tree here, it nonetheless remains enveloped by a dark, threatening background. The penultimate uh, painting of the series, Hanuman, the monkey lieutenant of Ram, is shown gliding through patches of clouds, balancing a mountain on his palm, bearing the inscription, Ames. Now, Ames is All India Institute of Medical Sciences in, in Delhi. Uh, Santos spoke about this painting as being a sequel to the Hanuman legend in, in Ramayana. In Ramayana, Hanuman is said to have brought an entire mountain full of uh, a life-saving herb, uh, Sanjeevani Bhuti, to the battlefield so that Lakshman could be treated with it. In this painting, the oral written scene from the Ramayana undergoes a visual substitution. The Sanjeevani Bhuti is substituted by the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the battlefield by relief camp, and Lakshman by the ailing Muslim families. A full semantic unraveling of the picture, needless to say, depends not only on the viewer's you know, knowledge of Ramayana scene, but also on the familiarity with the image of Hanuman carrying the mountain with Sanjeevni Bhutti to save Lakshman. Only then will the viewer will be able to replace Sanjeevni Bhutti with the aims uh, which Hanuman on Ram's order brings in order to save lives of people in relief camp. I find this very interesting again painting where you know like you, you are playing with both mythic times and, 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 and the historical time. The Gujarat series concludes with a painting that brings together distinct but interconnected uh, micro themes. In the lower section, framed figures of Ram and Gandhi are placed on top of a burning train. Looking away from the viewers, the figures have one of their hands placed on the foreheads, a gesture signifying pain and anguish, and are shedding tears. 
Together, these grieving figures of Ram and Gandhi represent for the artist that voice of Hindu tradition which has been systematically marginalized by the hegemonic politics of the right-wing fundamentalists. The helplessness of Ram and Gandhi in the painting is made more pronounced by the large black trident piercing the image of weeping Mother Earth. The image of weeping earth in distress due to the scar left by the trident represented, representing violence enacted in the name of religion during the carnage links this composition to the first in the series. The syntagmatic concatenation of images to paraphrase Umberto Eco greatly enhances this argumentative capacity. What I am arguing that, you know, I mean, this series Although it unfolds uh, in time, uh, but uh, it also challenges a certain notion of linearity. It, it folds back into its own self. So this last painting, in a sense, if I were to take you back to the first painting, it relates back to the first painting. Throughout the series, Santosh makes strategic use of Hindu religious symbols, motives and icons such as the lotus, trident, the shivlingam as well as the relevant scenes from Ramayana and other Hindu mythological texts. However, this strategy need not be read as an apology on part of, a, of an artist located within Hindu tradition. Rather, his painting draw attention to the fact that religious icons and symbols are historically mutable multivalent and open to political disruptions and manipulation. In the visualization of Hindu political organization, the Sangh Parivar, the figures of Ram is primarily metonym of Hindu India. However, Santosh's Gujarat series of painting convey that image of Ram as part of Indian tradition and aesthetic sensibility is more complex. I would just like to add here that it's it's very interesting coming from a metal artist um, because according to the myth uh, uh, Ram married Sita and Sita was daughter of Mithila I mean she was born in Mithila so what I find fascinating that although the hardline Hindu organization they want to co-opt Ram in a certain way even when I go and do field work right now during the marriage, uh, Ram is both uh, for people in Mithila, both a god as well as a son-in-law. So during marriage ritual, they sing songs where he's he's uh, he's referred to as our son-in-law, not God. You know. So what the artist is pointing to is this complex history of uh, of Hinduism, which somehow in certain discourse, uh, these other other things uh, get, you know, marginalized. The Gujarat series is a lament and expression of a sense of loss of tradition articulated by the artists in face of violence unleashed by the Hindu right-wing politics. As the compositions make it evident, not only humans but also gods mourn the loss and destruction of Muslim community in Gujarat. Thus, in the very first composition one may recall, it is the image of weeping earth surrounded by a deity which occupy our attention. By making the gods into witnesses as well as party to his lamentation, Santosh Das transforms the Gujarat series of 2002 from a local regional tragedy into, into a catastrophic event of cosmic proportion. And in the process, he constitutes a community that transcends not only spatial local localization, but also linguistic and religious boundaries. In, mourning a, in mounting a powerful critique of violence and the state's complicity, the series readily draws on resources that are part of metal tradition. Taking recourse to popular mythological imageries, the artist weaves a masterful tangle of allusions, hidden meanings, and allegories that traverse between cosmology and history. He creates alternative formulations around motives and icons whose me meanings are never stable. As the 16th century poet Saint Tulsi Das reminded the reader in Ram Charit Manas, 
द ग्लोरियस एक्ट्स ऑफ राम मे ऑलवेज बी सांग इन न्यू एज राम हिमसेल्फ माइट इवन अपियर एज ही डज इन संतोष गुजरात सीरीज नॉट एज ए वेंजफुल गॉड एज इज प्रेजेंटेड इन राम जन्मभूमि पोस्टर्स दीज आर पोस्टर्स विच व ब्रॉट आउट आफ्टर डिमोलिशन ऑफ बबरी मस्जिद बट एज सम वन मॉर्निंग विथ अदर डेट इज द डेथ एंड डिस्ट्रैक्शन ऑफ मुस्लिम कम्युनिटी गॉड संतोष रिमाइंडेड मी कैन नेवर बी कम्यूनल दे कैन नेवर बी अनजस्ट सो दिस वॉज वन सेट ऑफ पेंटिंग नाउ आई वॉन्ट टू टेक यू to a totally a different uh, set of painting uh, equally interesting if the gujarat series is a lament that makes us pause and take note of the macabre performance of state power the painting depicting dowry violence present another face of methil art traditions engagement with violence and justice in many ways the motivation and urgency to paint themes related to dowry and more generally violence against women is intimately tied up with the biographies the of some of these artists as the eldest of the four sisters shalini kumari a young sensitive artist remained troubled by the rampant practice of dowry among upper caste brahmins of mithila it touched her life since it would be very difficult for her parents to marry the four sisters especially given her family's modest economic means her anxiety was palpable when for the first time i had interacted with her during my field work in madhubani in 2005 2006 during one of our meetings i remember asking young women artists at mithila art institute in madhubani about the motivation behind painting so many dowry related pictures shalini's reply was revealing i like painting on issues related to dowry because it is spreading like wild fire in our society dowry incidents really trouble me see my father also has four daughters he will have to give dowry to marry us it is his compulsion that is why i think so much about dowry and its evil in our society Charlie is not alone in contemplating on dowry menace in metal society. Pinky Kumari, Rupam Kumari, two of her contemporaries have also explored dowry theme in their paintings. What is remarkable about their picturization is not simply the thematic content, but also the ways in which they explore the bounds of their inherited tradition of art making. Let me begin with uh, Let me begin with Pinky Kumari's composition title The Cycle of Dowry. In the lower section of the image field, she has depicted a bridegroom leading the bride. They are set to perform saptapadi, literally seven steps, the circumambulation of sacred fire. With the completion of this ritual, the marriage is deemed complete. as we shift our attention to the upper section we are faced with an upside down figure of weeping bride seated in front of the idol of god krishna as pinky put it she is evoking krishna to come to her rescue and relieve her from her misery like draupadi in mahabharat the two micro spaces in the painting connoting two distinct movements in women's life unfolding in different space and time is separated by bilaterally sym- symmetrical image of bride in chains placed at center of the image field the dowry articles which surround the central image act as a lash bringing together different micro spaces in the painting as viewers are accustomed to linear or single point perspective on the first glance we find pinky's dowry composition visually disconcerting due to our inability to differentiate foreground and background near and far and more specifically our difficulty in holding together different section of the image field as a composite whole although for the purpose of describing the composition i can continue to use the term upper and lower or top and bottom 
as we can see the composition negates or challenges this very cate categorization in the process it releases or makes available a semantic charge a surplus of meaning from within the image field by juxtaposing the two scenes that is uh, the the ritual of sapadi during uh, performed during uh, ritual uh, wed wedding ritual uh, so uh, just supposing these two these two scenes um, the sapadi ritual uh, during the wedding ceremony uh, with that the with that of the weeping bride at a conjugal home pinky not only brings out the critical intonation of each but very subtly also questions the popular imagination in which the ritual circumambulation around the sacred fire seven times stands for the vow that the couple will not part for seven lives now this is something which has been perpetuated through through hindi films uh, there is nothing like this in the ritual text which which connotes this this imagery which has no basis in ritual text has been popularized by hindi language cinema in her visualization there seems to be no escape from the dowry cycle and the violence built into the existing upper caste marriage system in mithila if at all there is way out of the cycle of violence and injustice it is only possible possible with divine intervention justice for tortured bride one might say is always in waiting for the gods to make their appearance in rupam kumari's picture story title bride burning or a woman's fate there is a denial of even this possibility while pinky hints towards violence within familial space rupam as it were takes domestic violence to its finality the burning of bride her composition is clear reminder reminder of the inevitability of violence against women within the hindu patriarchal family in composing a picture story rupam takes recourse to a compositional technique that is very different from the one employed by pinky she divides the pictorial surface into two horizontal registers each containing three distinct micro scenes uh, with a well defined frame or border the scene are arranged or knitted together in such a way that in process of moving from one to the other uh, in this case from left to right the viewer is able to follow the movement of the story just as in written text in the first framed scene we have figure of a bride being ritually anointed with mustard based turmeric paste by married women of a family this is a important preparatory rite called pasahin in mathli enacted few days prior to wedding ritual in the following frame we have a scene from the wedding day on his arrival the groom is stopped at the entrance of the inner courtyard by women from the bride's family for ritual examination as part of this ritual referred to as parikshan the groom is asked to recognize and name different household articles as we shift to the extreme right frame of the upper register we have a picture of sindurdan literally gifting of the vermilion powder in popular imagination the ritual of sindurdan along with sapadi has immense symbolic significance although it is the chaturthi ritual performed on the fourth day of the which of the wedding which marks completion of marriage ceremony in mithila somehow uh, the sindurdan has come to connote completion of of marriage due to the uh, popular popular media or, or presentation in popular media like cinema the upper register as we can see depicts three important rituals in the syntagmatic chain of events constituting the wedding ceremony at the bride's home in contrast the focus in the lower register shifts to a different time and space the extreme lower left frame shows a bride being transported from her natal to her conjugal home the following frame depicts the everyday life of a newly married bride in mithila within the image field 
the figure of bride sweeping the floor with a broom is overshadowed by her mother-in-law she can be seen as reprimanding the bride for not completing her domestic chores in the extreme lower right panel the figure of the bride is squatting on the floor amidst her belongings while her husband is pouring kerosene over her body the mother in law is about to light the mastic through the window we can see two children playing outside in rupam's picture story about women's fate it is this micro scene a frame within a frame which i find most numbing here the dowry violence is in a sense normalized even as the brutal crime is about to committed inside the house the life outside goes on as normal it seems to be a melancholic recognition what can we do life goes on i want you to hold on to this image for a moment i'll return to it a little later in my presentation like rupam and pinky shalini too sets out to narrate a real life story of a newly wed bride who was tossed to death for not bringing dowry what she found disturbing was that the dowry death was reported as an accident few weeks later the family performed a puja worship in order to purify the domestic space during the purification rites the eight petal lotus diagram was used incidentally the same lotus diagram also forms an important part of the wedding ceremony in this floor diagram vishnu's footprints his weapons and accessories are housed inside the lotus petal of the diagram shalini utilizes the lo lotus petal diagram uh, lotus diagram as a template to uh, to comment on dowry which often is the root cause of bride burning in this region now here you can this is a this is a eight petal lotus diagram which is also used during uh, is a very important uh, flow diagram used during uh, the wedding so uh, what she has done she has used that template to tell a story or tell her a comment on 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 the because to purify the ground after the dowry death the same diagram is also used in shalini's composition vishnu's footprints at center of the lotus diagram is substituted by the sacred fire altar in which the bride is shown in flames as i have already pointed out it is around the fire altar that ritual pertaining to the marriage take place surrounding the central image of the bride in flames we have alternating figure of bridegroom and his father while the bridegroom carries a board signifying his price in the dowry market his father is blindfolded connoting that he can envision nothing but dowry the bridegroom image is further flanked by figures of middlemen or intermediaries without whose intervention no marriage can be successfully negotiated in mithila the petal of the lotus diagram are adorned with alternating figures of bridegroom's mother with elongated tongue signifying unending greed and dowry objects In the lower left and lower right corner we have figures of the brides enclosed in flames emanating from earthen lamp above these two figures are situated the image of lakshmi the goddess of wealth and prosperity and vishnu the preserver of the universe both these divine figures are shown mourning over the unfolding of the incident The dowry theme finds expression in another of Shalini's many painting. Once again her motivation to do the painting comes from a real life event. The painting that I want to discuss is also inspired by one such story. During the day I came across a this is what she narrated to me. During the day I came across a very unpleasant incident. A newly wed bride had been tossed alive because her parents could not provide the dowry. 
I was greatly disturbed by the news. In the evening, I went to the temple near my house to pray. Inside the temple, I kept staring at the earthen lamp placed near the idol. And the more I looked at the lamp, the more the image of burning girl came to haunt me. I came back home and decided to paint the story. Unlike Charlie's lotus composition, this painting is extremely dense, both syntactically and semantically. On the central vertical axis, she has placed a terracotta lamp on top of a beetle leaf. At, top of, at the top, a woman is shown burning in flames originating from the wick of the terracotta lamp. The lamp wick in turn is fabricated out, out of the dowry articles. The middle section of the lamp is occupied by figures depicting the bride's parents. Both are in distress due to unending dowry demands imposed on them as well as their inability to save their daughter's life. The bride's parents are surrounded by plethora of weeping eyes, each connoting a parent in a similar situation. The bridegroom's parents, with their unending demanding demands for dowry, occupy the base of the lamp. Just below the lamp is in the lower section, we have the figure of bridegroom in a confused state of mind. He desires a good bride. His parents wa want a good daughter-in-law who would also bring lot of dowry. The resolution of the dowry problem as the painting tries to draw attention to lies not so much in the iconic figure of Lady Justice or in the provisions in the IPC, Indian Penal Code but tacitly in the figures of the bridegroom and his mother. In the lower right hand corner, the image field, we can see the bridegroom's mother emerging from the jaws of dowry, protesting against the dowry practices. Similarly, in the lower left hand corner, the bridegroom can be seen emerging from the jaws of wealth, holding the bride's hand. Charlene's depiction is more than a visual documentation of a real life event. It also, it is also a portrayal of a route, a way out of the existing dowry problem. Now I shift to one of the most, uh, you know, uh, disturbing painting I have come across. Now let me end with a most provocative painting I have seen done by a metal artist. Title What Should Happen But Has Not Yet Happened. This painting of Supriya Jha was recently displayed an art exhibition in Delhi. In the left section of the picture surface, we see a trouser clad man pouring kerosene over a despondent woman squatting on the floor with her wrist tied. The figure adjacent to her has a lit mastic in her hand. She is about to set ablaze the woman sitting on the floor. The trio in the scene are the mother-in-law, her daughter-in-law and her son. As we shift our attention to the right section, we see a community of agitated women marching into the house with the intention of preventing the mother-in-law for setting on uh, fire her daughter-in-law. When we look closely, we find that the woman leading the agitated group also has a lit mastic in her hand. She is proceeding towards the mother-in-law with the intention of burning her. Another woman protester can be seen pouring kerosene over the mother-in-law through the outward facing window. How are we to comprehend this rather unsettling picturization of justice? Should it be simply viewed as a portrayal of vigilante, vigilantism frequently reported in press? Or is there something more to this painting that escapes the first cursory glance? Before I address these issues, I would like to take you back to the last panel of Rupam Kumari's picture story. What instantly holds our attention is the sight of a helpless bride about to be set ablaze by her husband and her mother-in-law. But as our sight drifts outside the window, we also see two children playing with gay abandon. 
after lingering for a moment when we revert back to the scene unfolding inside the room we no longer remain the same the concatenation of these two visual enclaves as it were burdens the panel with additional set of meaning now let me place this panel alongside supriya's painting and at once one is led to voice with her but why should life simply go on as normal supriya's painting i would like to argue can only be meaningful understood in relationship to other paintings that i have discussed why did she compose the painting in this manner her answer takes us to the heart of the issue and th- this i'm quoting her by the time the police registers the case if at all they do or the courts intervene in the case such as these it is invariably too late the bride is murdered the community of women who intervene in the picture are not concerned with securing justice through state law rather the notion of justice is practical and symbolic practical in the sense of preventing the murder from taking place and symbolic by making or setting a precedence of justice that no mother in law would dare to burn her daughter in law ever again would not uh, women in revolt fear laws retribution i asked her she replied with a smile it does not matter what the law and the courts say or do what can they do how how will it be proven that the women burnt the mother in law no one would give evidence against the group of women in revolt the image that congeals is of a community of women one that in a different context vinadas calls affiliative community who unlike state law not only have the power to intervene but also prevent cases of bride burning sit on judgment and extract punishment by investing the uh, by investing the violence on the perpetrators the visualization of the burning of the mother in law is subversive within a visual economy accustomed to representing burning brides the image of a threat to burn the mother in law as an act of resistance as a deterrent supriya believes would end dowry violence accompanies the rejection of state law as a site of justice for state law can only resurrect justice after the bride is dead supriya longs for a life for the victim of the dowry violence and refuses to visualize the murderous mother in law as a passive agent of patriarchy state law cannot gift life to the victim of dowry harassment it is the radical affiliative community of women who can do so the visuality that supriya makes available through a painting forces one to think what if its provocation lies not so much in imitating or mirroring reality but imagining a possibility of a future opulent with better tomorrow in doing so she translates anger rather than sorrow visually it is what if which opens out a series of thought on how one may visualize justice thank you thank you very much uh, mani uh, for having shown us and uh, explained uh, the series of uh, moving uh, uh, pictures uh, and my suspicion that it is not only moving emotionally but that it is also aesthetically uh, speaking to to us uh, has been uh, proven exactly uh, the last one uh, is a, a, a very very impressive one to see uh, how the female the women's community is acting as a compensation of uh, for a lack of a of a real legal community and this is a, a, a very 
uh, very beautiful and, and very impressive. So, uh, uh, just two words for uh, Jose. Most of you know him and by interaction, but uh, I should at least be uh, correct to name, especially his affiliation to the group Yusminaku, uh, Justice, Memory, Na Narration and Culture at um, the University uh, of Madrid. Uh, you know him as a specialist in a lot of fields. Uh, uh, a selected uh, view on his publications might be uh, uh, might give some some of his backgrounds. La máquina burocrática, afinidades electivas entre Max Weber y Kafka uh, from '89. Uh, Las suelas de Fausto. Uh, la socio sociología del conocimiento y de la uh, ciencia uh, oda de metáforas del poder from, uh, uh, of uh, 1998 and uh, la diosa fortuna uh, where he got uh, uh, in general he gets prices for his books and so so we're waiting for his book to be finished here because uh, we are we are also taking the prices very voluntarily this is also said to everybody who is writing writing his book and uh, who thinks about what kind of price he could again we are always interested and uh, we'll have a nice vitrine for all the prizes you see one day but now uh, the comment of a specialist in uh, visualizing uh, law, especially justice, with regard to a rather different cultural context. And uh, so I'm, I'm very curious to, to hear about your impressions. Thank you very much for having done it. Just, uh, you had not, no more than two days for that, or yeah, even yeah, one yeah. day. And thank you very much for having done it, and very welcome again yeah, at our center. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Professor Mani Sekas uh, Singh for your wonderful lecture that introduced us in a very complete new world of painting, violence, and justice. And thank you, Professor Werner Gebhardt, for giving me the opportunity to of expressing some comments about the lecture, and I promise you only five minutes. Yeah, just to open the conversation. I must confess that the first time I saw the paintings this painting on the wall of the nuptial chamber, I was lost in translation, or probably better, lost in interpretation. How is possible the understanding of the Mithila painting from our Western way of representation? I'm just now writing a book, as you know, on the different traditions of representing justice in Western countries, especially about the goddess of justice or lady justice in a more contemporary de denomination and her extremely good side during centuries and how and why the blindfolding on her eyes was introduced and how the blindfolding was changing in history up to now. When I saw for the first time this image I thought that I had to put away my blindfolding on my eyes, my Western prejudices, in order to understand a complete new world of painting and representation, and try to introduce myself in it. For me, it is an example of the great differences between cultures uh, and between historical contexts, and it is worth to ask ourselves if there are really possibilities of interpretation and translation between so different cultures and pictorial traditions. Probably the world as such doesn't exist anymore. There are plurality of worlds. I want to underline the idea of world because we have here a new, yeah, for me at least, a new representation of the whole world in this picture. We have the representation of, of the sun and of the moon. The earth, the mother earth, it is also, I don't know exactly where, but it is also the picture. All the planets are represented also in the pictures, so it is a way of a cosmovision here. Also in the, uh, in the bride, and the bridegroom, 
also the, the lotus flower that uh, signifies different things, but especially with uh, the eight leaves of the, uh, of the lotus plant is represented a symbol of female beauty and fertility and it is also a sexual symbol of the bride. Then, so the, the feminine uh, point of view, the feminine uh, reali uh, reality is also there. Also the, the man reality represented by a bamboo plant, this uh, very significant uh, phallic uh, symbol, symbolization. Then <coughs> the pond of life, the pond of life is the representation of the whole life and is here with the lotus plant and the pond of life means also fertility. The pond of life is full of life, forms and productive, productive powers. And there, is, there are so many different animals, especially, especially fish. Well, fish are symbolizations of good luck and uh, also of fertility. There are parrots, so many. They are representing the, here the, conversa the initial conversation of bride and uh, bridegroom for the couple, for the, uh, in, uh, for the intersexual curves, and well, it is completely uh, full of this kind of parrots also here, and there is also an elephant as a symbol of good luck as well. So everything is in the picture, a whole, a whole world is in the picture. And every single thing, and every single animal, or every single uh, element has a meaning related to the whole, and it must be also interpreted in the context of religious beliefs. The whole composition, the geometry, I was also very, uh, very astonished because of the uh, geometry, and the variety of figures are very relevant. Well, the second point of my observation is about the inter interesting short story that uh, Mani explained us about metal art and the change from the private sphere where this was put on, in the interior of the house, the wall ritual art, to the transition to the global, uh, global stage as art on paper. I don't want to ask uh, you about the consequences of commercialization and globalization of metal art. In the last decades, there are public institutions in India, as the Ethnic Arts Foundation or the Mithila Art Institute, that organized, for example, a traveling exhibition of metal art, and that is, metal art is uh, spread all over the world in this time of globalization. And the new met, uh, metal art on paper has given, obviously, many advantages for people, especially for, uh, for young women, giving them the possibility of having a job. This is very clear. But it is uh, it. It also helped to uh, the institutionalized of this uh, kind of pin painting by the state uh, institutions um, can make also to lose independence and freedom. I guess that the artists you have presented us are independent artists, so they are free in choosing the the uh, topics on violence and justice, but. My question is, there is a gap between these artists and the other, and the other artists working in a more institutionalized way. The point is about uh, meditation on violence and justice, the Gujarat violence of 2002. Well, I can't show you, well, um, repeat all the, the pictures because I have no time, but uh, I want to stress that I was also puzzled, puzzled in the, in, by the representation of different gods 
and goddesses in other in, in other paintings, especially in those series, in this series about the violence in Gujarat. There are Radha and Krishna, or uh, Krishna Mestra, the self decapitated uh, uh, goddess, or goddess Darga and Shiva in Gujarat series, or Ram being worshipped by the laity and sages. There is a mixture, a very uh, a strange mixture, of, uh, if we see it from the Western perspective, a mixture between, between myth, myths, religion, and violence in everyday life. All this is put together. I, I don't know exactly why. I would want to, to hear more about that. This mixture is also to be seen in other pictures, in picture well, number 10 uh, in, in the paper. Uh, the paper uh, uh, Mani gave me, the pictures were, uh, had a, a number, but here the number is, has disappeared. Well, this one? Uh, no. No, no, but, well, I think, I think this one is wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah, the perspective of the train coming to the, to the view, the, the, uh, the brand, the fire of the, of the train, and the train is also having two different positions. That is number 10. Yeah. Oh, then I have, I have other, other oh. numerations. Well, it is you the can same. Just it is the same. Shifted, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. Well, there are so many other. Uh, well, I think it is this one where the, there is a mixture between myths and religion, history, Gandhi. Well, the history also of the train is over there, is at the bottom, very well done. And the, the trident inside the Mother Earth. This is the weeping Mother Earth. This, uh, what? Well, Mother Earth is crying of pain. Yeah. Then for uh, about Dory, violence against women and the possibility of justice. This is the last point I would want to stress. I would want here to stress uh, in relation between uh, the uh, picture two I, I was seen before, we were seen before, and this picture that is the, just the representation of the contrary. If the first one was the representation of joy, of the, uh, of the ideal representation of the wedding, here is the representation of the consequences of dowry, and it is the, the center of the scene is the bride in, in fire. And all the situation is represented under the same a uh, circle of eight uh, leaves of the uh, lotus plant. But it is exactly the, the contrary meaning. This, I think this is a very good uh, way of transforming this, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, picture we saw with this other situation. The first one was the, the ideal of a wedding. Here is the reality of wedding because of the dowry. Um, by the way, um, I must remember that the dowry as an institution in India is a mixture of very old traditions with the European legacy of Portuguese and English empire. So the lotus diagram is also used here to comment on dowry, which often is the root cause of bright burning in the region. Well, I think there is also a visual connection between the representation of Earth in other, uh, in other uh, pictures, in the picture we saw just before, and the representation of Earth here. Because 
it is clear in the interpretation of money that this is a leaf. It is very clear. It is also clear that this is a flame, and the, and the plug is put in the flame. They are the, 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 the father and mother of the bride, and there are also plenty of, uh, of eyes crying. But <coughs> for me, the center of the picture is the, the, the face of the Mother Earth. The two big eyes, and the, the, what the nose, and the big smile. And why is she smiling? Because there is a solution to the, to the dowry problem. If the mother of the, of the, of the bridegroom protests, like here, against the institution of the dowry, and then here the uh, bridegroom, the, uh, the bridegroom gives his hand to the bride and love triumphs against money. So there are also other, kind, other, uh, other uh, hands given. And I think this is, for me, I don't know if it is a mistake to, to understand this in, in this way, but it, uh, I would want to connect this with the uh, with my uh, remembrance of uh, Professor Baxi, who used to explain here, in this uh, room, that uh, it was very important to introduce a new human right, the, the right to laughter. So here is an homage as well to Professor Baxi. <laughs> well, finally, I would want to introduce a philosophical point of view, a new theory of justice based on the memory of the victims. In a philosophical level, the Spanish philosopher Reyes Mate has elaborated a new theory of justice based in the remembering of the victims, in recovering their memory. He sees justice as a response to the injustice of the past or present as a memory of the victims of history in a Benjaminian sense. Well, in this sense, I think that the new media painting has given voice to the voiceless. Justice begins with a cry, with a protest of the victims against injustice. We must hear the cry of middle art in solidarity with the victims of any kind of violence. And I say thank you to many for giving, for uh, opening, for opening our eyes to a new world of represent, representation of justice and justice and violence. Thank you.